The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect the policies and the Together with experts and newsmakers, we'll make sense of the week's biggest issues and stories. I'm Barney Below. In tonight's conversation. Close to half of adults in the Philippines say they're jobless. That's more than 27 million Filipinos, based on a July SWS survey. Those figures, much higher than the government's unemployment rate in April which was already a staggering 17.7%. The Philippines, which in recent years had been Asia's rising economic star, has sunk into recession. But after months of lockdowns to try to curb the spread of the coronavirus, Melanyang says it shouldn't come as a surprise. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque assures it's temporary. Congress, however, isn't taking the crisis sitting down. A 165 billion peso stimulus package is likely to be passed into law next week. Though it's an amount, some lawmakers say, that may only be enough to tide us over in the short term. And good evening once again and welcome to the program. Welcome our viewers on Facebook and of course, welcome to our uh, two guests tonight who will be talking about the economy and the reality of business amid this pandemic. Tonight, we have two guests who are experts in their own fields. First is Marikina, 2nd District Representative and an economist herself, Congresswoman Stella Kimbo. Good evening, Congresswoman Kimbo. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, Barnes, RJ, and Paul. And uh, good evening as well to um, an entrepreneur, uh, TV host, events host, and co-founder of Mercado Central Food Market, RJ Ledesma. Hi, RJ. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, thanks so much for having me here. And now you know, it's truly a pleasure to be with you, uh, Barnaby. But you know what? I am very floored but that I am beside Congresswoman Stella Kimbo. Idol ko yan eh. Pati idol ko rin yung asawa niyan. So, baka makikinig lang ako kay Congresswoman na Stella habang kinikwento yung state ng ating ekonomiya. Uh, don't worry. I'll, I'll let you talk. <laughs> you might be bored with me. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say that yes okay so um like i said we will be talking about the state of our economy and we will be talking about the realities of uh, business and um, employment or unemployment uh, for this matter uh, on the ground but before we go to the q a i believe congresswoman kimbo has a slideshow that she would like to uh, show to us and explain some of the um, the ongoing economic problems right now, as well as the solution that they have for us in Congress. Go ahead, uh, Congresswoman Kimbo. Or if this is usual, na nagpapa slide show ang guest. <laughs> but but anyway, it's going to be very short, just three this slides. Is the of an uh, online talk show, you know, uh, we don't really have the time <laughs> limit they sure. have on TV, you know. So, go ahead. All right, um, Paul, would you could you kindly share? So yeah, I just thought of like sharing a few statistics um, to like get us in the mood to think about the economy and uh, the COVID situation, which is obviously in everyone's minds. As of the moment, uh, go ahead, uh, Congresswoman Kimbo. The, the slides are up. Yeah. Oh, hmm. Why am I not seeing it? Okay, that that's the first slide. Um, you see the. That's the curve. That's the epidemic curve, right? You're seeing it. Oh. Oh, sorry. Okay, so where are we at the moment? Um, economic managers recently announced. Uh, second quarter GDP, and uh, they reported um, a very big contraction of 16.5%. I think it's the biggest contraction um, recorded at least in the last how many decades, maybe 
two or three decades. Um, total economic losses as of the end of the first SEM has already reached 1.5 trillion pesos. And uh, more importantly, um, because of these two quarters um, performance, um, the economic managers estimated that for the entire 2020, the contraction is going to be something like 5.5%, which means um, that would be about a 2.4 trillion peso loss. So that's a very big number, obviously. Um, and at this point, what does that mean um, in uh, concrete terms? So madaling salita ang ibig sabihin ng napakalaking uh, economic loss is napakarami rin nawala ng trabaho. Mm -hmm. And as of the end of April, um, our unemployment rate is also at the highest level, 17.7%. In fact, it's the highest level ever recorded since the 1950s when we started to conduct the labor force survey. And uh, a 17.7% unemployment rate means 7.2 million Filipinos without jobs. And uh, what is a cause for concern is also that at the point when we recorded a 17.7 unemployment rate, we also recorded that about 13 million Filipinos had continued to have jobs, which means they were still employed, but they were not at work, which means they were employed in what we call non-essential sectors, meaning these sectors that were not allowed to operate during the lockdown, and which also means that their employers basically were paying for their salaries despite not having revenues, which means at this point in, not, in time, they could really be cash strapped. So in other words, these 13 million Filipinos are at risk of losing their jobs. So September 6 is going to be the next uh, important date as far as the economy is concerned because the Philippine St Statistics Authority would be announcing um, unemployment rate. So that's in a few days, uh, but I worry that um, clearly it's not 7.25 million anymore. I think it's going to be a bigger number, um, considering that the SWS also recently conducted a survey of joblessness, and they found that I think 27 million Filipinos um, are already jobless at this point. So anyway, um, but what's the maximum number of uh, jobless Filipinos? It's, well, the maximum is probably 29 million workers because this would be the count of workers in what we call non-essential sectors. But hopefully, um, wag naman sana umabot on because napakalaking number non, right? Um, so, there. So, that's the situation at this point in time. Uh, we in Congress, as early as March, had already been discussing what we need to do. And uh, our speaker, uh, constituted an economic stimulus subcommittee, uh, co-chaired by myself, Congressman Joey Salceda, and Congresswoman Sharon Garin. Um, so we put together all of the ideas of the Kongs and came up with a bill called a RICE Bill, which proposes a 1.3 trillion economic stimulus package. And this was passed by Congress last June 4. Um, but, uh, of course, the Senate still has to deliberate on that bill. Meanwhile, uh, ang naipasa recently was the Bayanihan 2. So I would like to go to that slide, the next slide, please, which is a summary of uh, Bayanihan 2. Um, so this authorizes spending of 140 billion pesos and an additional 25 billion in standby funds. Okay, what standby funds means is that uh, we can we can spend for these items so long as the funds will be made available. In other words, the 140 billion would be immediately made available. The 25 would be available as soon as the government is able to get uh, a sufficient amount of revenues. Okay, so what is Bayanihan 2 all about? So Basically, these are the four things that uh, Bayanihan 2 seeks to do. The number one most important task at this point is to control the spread of COVID-19. And we've allotted about 30.5 billion pesos and an additional 10, by, uh, 10 billion standby fund. 
All right. Um, so kasama dito ang uh, testing, kasama dito ang PPEs, ang face masks, which the president uh, promised uh, the Filipinos uh, in the last State of the Nation address. So I think about 20 million Filipinos will be given free face masks. Uh, of course, nandito rin ang isolation facilities. At this point in time, it's very important to do contact tracing. And of course, those that are positive or suspected to be positive um, and need uh, isolation um, would would many of our Filipinos kasi, di ba, um, would not have the proper isolation facilities in, in their houses. And so at least the isolation facilities that the government will provide can uh, can allow proper isolation to happen. And uh, in addition, there is 6.5 billion pesos for, for subsidies for households. And the uh, idea dito is dapat mabigyan ng ayuda, um, particularly those individuals that need to be isolated. Alam naman natin that that's one obstacle to isolation. Of course, um, once you are isolated. Ang ibig sabihin nun, um, baka mawalan ng basic, walang, makakain ng ating pamilya yung may iwan sa bahay. And so we have to make sure that um, their needs are uh, are uh, are uh, provided for. In addition, there's support for displaced workers. Uh, we have a cash for work and unemployment assistance provision amount to 13 billion pesos. Um, kasama na dito yung um, i-hire natin na contact tracers. Then we have 5.5 billion for displaced transport workers. Of course, the problem with uh, the transport sector is that social distancing is very important, which means automatically your revenues are going to be cut in half. And not only that, um, the workers, many workers would also be displaced. We also have this uh, 3.1 billion pesos for displaced tourism workers and uh, 300 million for displaced teachers in both the public and private sectors, as well as 1 billion pesos uh, for test training. Again, for displaced workers, at this point in time, clearly the name of the game is retooling. And sinasabi nga nila, we now have a new normal. So uh, we, there's going to be a great need for capacity building, for retraining, for retooling, so that our workers can cope with the new normal. And then, of course, um, this is very important. We set aside uh, how much? Uh, 41.5 billion and an additional 15 billion in standby funds for credit. Um, so these are going to be low interest loans, particularly targeted to, targeted to critically impacted businesses, especially the small businesses and uh, those critically impact, impacted sectors, including tourism and uh, transportation. And uh, to promote business continuity, important din yung regulatory relief. Ang isa sa mga, I'm sure RJ would, would know this, ang isa sa reklamo ng ating business people is that our environment is not very competitive, napaka mahal to do um, business. In other words, cost of doing business is quite high. And uh, ang isang malaking factor dyan would be all of these um, regulations that are uh, required of businesses. And so a lot of the provisions in Bayanihan are, are, are for the purpose of providing regulatory relief for business. And uh, there's also language on provision, sorry, on preference for, dom for domestic manufacturers. So for example, for um, the PPEs, the face masks, um, and all the protective gear that government would need to procure, a uh, meron time provision John for domestic preference. And then finally, napaka important for business continuity, uh, remember many of our businesses in order to survive would have to shift to online platform. But in order to do that, we need faster internet. And in order for faster internet to happen, we need approval. Yeah. Infrastructure, yes. Yeah. So we need infrastructure. So meron din tayong um, provision. So we have a monetary provision for that, um, particularly for schools, um, a total of seven billion for ICT infrastructure in both SUCs as well as public schools. Um, there's also 1.3 billion for transport uh, infrastructure. In addition to infra for um, connectivity, there's also a provision that will make it easier for our telcos to uh, set up or to construct cell towers. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, 
we need to improve our economic resilience, meaning the ability of our economy to uh, withstand shocks and to recover from shocks. And uh, very important dito ang agriculture sector. Just in case magtagal ang pandemic, we want to be sure that uh, we have food security, just in case that we are unable to import food from our usual trading partners. We have to make sure that we can domestically produce what we have to eat, right? And uh, I think it was only in uh, agriculture that we had um, a slight uptick yeah. um, in economic growth. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's the only that's the only sector that actually one Group. of the <laughs> yeah only among the three. So agri, oh. industry, and services. That's that was the only one that grew. Um, I guess because it, well, number one, it's an essential sector, and like services. Up to today, I mean, it, it's a non-essential sector, right? Of course, manufacturing is like half and half. Some of those, meaning the, the ones with high value added, um, they're allowed to operate, but only at skeletal workforce, right? So because the agricultural sector was considered essential, then obviously that was the only one that was able to grow. All right, and I think I have one more slide. I don't know what, okay, what's the last slide? Uh, by any hand, three. All right, all right. So what's after that? So I mentioned earlier economic damage is about 2.4 trillion pesos at a five minus 5.5 GDP growth. But to be honest, it can be even more than that. Some have been forecasting up to 9%, up to 10%, in which case it's going to be clearly more than 2.4 trillion pesos. Economic stimulus is needed to avert that loss. All right. And so how much do we need based on the Arise bill that we passed? Um, we computed that we needed something like 1.3 trillion pesos for three years. Need a all in one shot. Um, but of course, Bayanihan was passed at 165, including the standby fund. It's rather small compared to the 1.3 trillion that we think we need. But clearly, 165 is welcome at this point in time, kahit na anong Pwedeng ibigay ng gobyerno, um, kailangan tanggapin natin. But we want to make sure as well that it's well spent. Dahil napaka-konti na nga, um, kailangan well spent. So yung kunento ko earlier, yun yung framework ng bayanihan. No? So we need to control the, the pandemic first. We need to promote business continuity to preserve jobs. Um, and for that to happen, we need regulatory relief. We need loans, especially for small businesses. Uh, we need uh, connectivity, but meanwhile, we also need some subsidies to the households as well as the displaced workers because that's the yun intervention natin on the demand side. So we really need to do interventions on both demand and supply side. So bottom line, we need Bayanihan 3. Kulang pa yung Bayanihan 2. Following maybe the same approach, the same story that I had just described, but we need to do that because it's kulang pa ang 165 billion. So I'll probably end the year and uh, maybe give RJ a chance to... No, actually, I actually had a question kay, uh, kay Congresswoman Estela. Uh, looking at all, all the economic stimulus packages, I mean, I'm glad that you and, and, and Joey still said are there to look out from the, the what because our biggest worry as as uh, as uh, entrepreneurs and business people was that they were doing everything for this for the demand side, but the in other words, they were helping the households, but they weren't helping the MSMEs. Uh, that where they're going to spend the money on eventually if there's no more MSMEs uh, that exist. Uh, my my uh, my my first concern is really. Um, the way that they're allocating the money right now, I remember that they had to do Bayanihan too because SBC had run out of money already to, to loan to people. How are they able to vet right now on who should who, who should they lend the money to? Because I know that the, the, the amount of money that you can do for SBC is up to 500K, eh, diba? Then Who gets it? Because they said that there's money, they just lost it. That's one concern that I have. And, and the, the second concern also that I was wondering no, is really, you know, uh, our credit rating, our, 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 I think that's a big thing. No? Uh, I, I've been in other talks where they were saying that the, we're probably one of the best. We're being managed fiscally well during this time because even our credit ratings improved with the Japanese Credit Ratings Agency. But it, will, it, it might change because, you know, we're actually, we're actually borrowing more money to pay for, for all these, to, to, to pay for all of these uh, economic stimulus. So, I guess my first question is how well is it managed to help? What are we really doing to help the MSMEs? And is it something that is very uh, reasonable or manageable? But number two, my big concern is how are we paying for all this economic stimulus, uh, Congressman Stella? 
Sorry to take your role for a bit, Barnaby. No, I wear two hats usually when I ask questions. But, understand, but um, because I understand that businessmen also have a lot of concerns, and in fact, I'm going to add to that because I also know a n- good number of businessmen, and they were telling me that um, wala naman silang malon talaga uh, from the banks. You know, it it's so hard for them to be able to make those loans, and some of them have been saying that they're not really getting relief from their loans. Um, it's just a temporary relief, pero si singilin parin naman talaga sila. So for them, it's not really relief. I don't know if um, RJ has the same experience. <clears throat> right. well, well, yes, there's a lot of problems um, I have, but then that, that's okay. <laughs> there's a lot of problems right now, but please. Yes, uh, so yeah, for the first set of questions, um, how do we ensure na yung kakaunting pera na lang na, na, nakalagay sa bayanihan to will go to those that really need it the most? That's a oh. question. Oh. So there's a there's a concept that is introduced in the bill, which was also in the Arise bill, um, that of critically impacted sectors. All right. So and that is it's clear, no. So between an essential um, business and a non-essential business, must critically impacted by COVID and non-essential, controlling for all things. I mean, assuming that they're the same size, same profitability, etc. The essential sector, the others in the non-essential sector, clearly must critically impacted. You know, as a non-essential sector, because because of the lockdown, hindi sila nakaoperate, nag na force sila to shut down. So clearly, yun ang ibig sabi ng critically impacted. So, medyo may pagka clear naman yan sa batas na yan yung intent, right? In fact, um, if you look at all the sectors, ano ba yung example ng critically impacted? So again, tourism, di ba? trade bucket eh kasi sila yung unang affected ng lockdown you know ng covid with oh. or without the lockdown sila yung unang natamaan bucket because yung business nila relies on movement across borders oh. di ba eh kahit hindi naman tayo nag-lockdown nung narinig ng na mga dayuhan na ay may pandemic i-cancel na natin lahat ng trips to the Philippines di ba so kahit walang lockdown affected si tourism so critically impacted right same thing with exporters ganun din Diba? Because nagre-rely sa movement across borders. Now, okay, doon naman sa hindi nagre-rely sa movement across borders, public transportation, diba? Eh, kailangan na social distancing, eh, diba? Um, so, na- ngayon, automatic, kahit na allowed sila to operate, 50% lang talaga yung passengers. Retail trade, yan, number one din yan. So, construction, ayan. So, Alam natin ko ni critically impacted on on those ba- uh, based on those parameters. So in the in the law in Bayanihan too, may ganun na language, no? So for SBC, um, we allot six uh, sorry how much six billion pesos for loans to critically impacted sectors. Ganun yung language, including MSMEs. and tourism oh. ah, and transport. I think may transport so, yan. So ibig sabihin yan, um, um, you know, kung Kung, uh, Congressman Kimbo, na, if I give it to critically impacted sectors, I'm just thinking like if I was a businessman, no? uh-huh. I will lend you interest free, but I'm probably not going to expect to, I'm probably not, not going to expect to get the money back uh, because okay. because you're a critically yeah. impacted okay. sector. Okay, okay. Sandela, sorry, buti na lang yun. Kasi one half lang yun ng equation. So okay. yung sinasabi ko kasi sa yung credit programs, government financial institutions ang mag-implement niyan. Uh-huh. Like bank, DBP, small business corporation, yun yung tatlo. On top of that, meron tayong nilagay na pondo for Philippine Guarantee Corporation. Okay. okay. In other words, you're a small business, wala kang pang collateral, kumuha ka ng guarantee from PGC. Okay? So in other words, um, yun naman yung uh, cover din naman yun ng ating GFIs. Diba? Because kung walang collateral, walang guarantee from government, hindi naman sila magpapautang. Right? So we need, so we lodge 5 billion pesos sa Philippine Guarantee Corporation. And sabihin na natin with an NPL of uh, of what? 10%? Mm-hmm. Yung 5 billion mo will at least cover 50 billion, di ba? Worth of loans. Assuming okay. na ang 10% yan would be bad loans, yung 5 billion is enough to support 50 billion pesos worth of loans. So exact lang yung proportion niya. Kasi okay. nag-set aside tayo ng 50 billion in loans. So ganun yung story anon, right? Um, now, Question is, uh, um, are we paying for all this? Uh... Are we paying? Okay. So, well, una sa lahat, 
yung source ng 140 billion savings lahat. I mentioned earlier, baka wala ka pa dito, um, RJ. Um, I think based on the last time I checked, 1.7 trillion pesos na ang nautang ng gobyerno no, since the pandemic. Pero itong 140 billion is going to be sourced entirely on savings or from savings. So hindi pa natin gagastos yun dyan yung, yung uh, inutang natin. Now, as to makakabayad ba tayo? Um, alam mo, dalawa lang yan eh. Una sa lahat, um, hindi naman tayo magkakaroon ng credit upgrade kung hindi tayo credit worthy. Diba? So may science naman yun eh. You get a credit upgrade because you're getting your credit worthiness has improved. Diba? Credit worthiness simply means uh, pwede ito makabayad. Diba? Kung banko ka, mataas ang credit rating mo, inaasahan ko makakabayad ka kasi based on your track record in the past, how you've managed your coffers, etc. And, and not only that, Eh, Stern has been talaga ang ating so PSP. Maayos ang ating macro fundamentals. So pa, kasama 'yon sa credit rating upgrade. Yes, pero the, some concern has been that itong inutang natin, although kaya nating bayaran, pero babayaran siya ng generations and generations and generations. So parang hindi na natin matapos-tapos bayaran yung mga utang natin. Actually not necessarily. Um Kasi siguro ina-equate ina- natin doon sa masamang debt crisis na nangyari sa atin noong 80s. Kasi nung umuutang tayo, eh hindi naman natin ginamit yon productively. Ito, ito si RJ, negosyante yan. Kapag umuutang ka na, RJ, di ba, nakakabayad ka naman as long as ginamit mo ng tama, walang nagnakaw oh. na empleyado mo doon sa pera mo, di ba? Talagang mo yung talaga ginawa mo yung factory, talagang ginawa mo yung pag-production yan. Exactly. Medyo okay, okay ka dyan. Oh. Ang tayo ng factory, at wala naman nagnakaw niya, na itayo mo si factory, and your plans went as you had wanted it to go, makakabayad ka, di ba? So sa tingin ko naman, we are in precisely in that situation. Kaya nga tayo nagkaroon ng credit upgrade. Okay, so in other words, sa madaling salita, um, ako ay confident na kahit malaking inutang natin, kaya natin bayaran. And not only that, lahat talaga ng bansa, umutang talaga ng katakot-takot. Ah, okay, so hindi, lang, hindi lang, so for perspective, lahat umutang naman ngayon. Lahat umutang. At okay, ang sige. utang natin, relative to everybody else, is barya. Ah, okay, sige. Okay. So, yes, so, so, ang ito maliit. Right now, ang, je- ang debt to GDP ratio natin, 39%. Yata, 40%. O yun ang sabi ni BSP Gov k- kagabi sa amin. Eh, ang Japan, 200% na yata. Diba? So, ibig sabihin, talagang because of the pandemic, ito talaga mangyayari. Okay? So, and then may question pa kayo na maganda yung sinabi ni Barnes na ang konti, ah, hindi naman malakas magpautang ang banko ngayon. Kahit na sabihin natin na yung BSP nagbaba ng reserve requirement. Kasi ibig sabihin nun, okay, ano ba ibig sabihin ng reserve requirement? Lahat ng banko, kailangan mag-park ng a portion of their funds sa BSP. Okay? So, kapag yung reserves, reserve requirement na yan is binababaan ng BSP, mas maraming na free up na pera yung mga banko. Pwede nilang ipautang. So, ang unang ginawa ng BSP no nagka-pandemic is binaba niya yung reserve requirement. In other words, mas konti na lang ang kailangan ipark na funds doon sa BSP. So, ang problema, kahit dumami ang ang loanable funds ng mga banko, takot naman sila magpautang. In other words, lahat tayo mababa ang kumpiyansa as a consumer, as an investor, as a worker, low confidence level. So, yun ang problema natin ngayon. So, hopefully, because government is beginning to spend, so ang first step na nga, itong bayanihan to, um, Sana naman, kahit paano, tumaas-taas ang confidence levels. Kaya malaki yung nilagay natin na pondo para sa health. Yung uh, we put in 30.5 billion, that's already one-third of the entire Bayanihan fund. Bakit? Because that's the only way magkaka-confidence sa mga tao. If we're able to control the pandemic, mas lalakas ang loob natin to leave our houses. So yun yung... Yun okay, yung, uh, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, take a step back and ask RJ about the problems on the ground. You're, of course, in the food business, and you're also in the in in events. How bad has it really been? Because um, you know, Congresswoman Kimbo 
showed us some figures, and oh. the figures are, <laughs> I mean, the figures are dire. Oh, uh, do they match, you know, what you're experiencing on the ground? Okay, uh, I have to give you a dip, uh, sort of like a perspective of where I'm coming from, uh, Congresswoman and, and Barnes, no? it's because, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, uh, this is what you're trying to do. You, you look at things with sort of like what I call an entrepreneurial mindset. What does that mean when you look at something as an, with an entrepreneurial mindset? Think of, an, think of it like uh, being an entrepreneur is like wearing a pair of lens. And if I look at the economy right now, and I look at it, uh, if I look what's happening right now, I look at it with the eyes of a normal person, then obviously I'm going to get very, very scared about what's happening all around me. Because, siyempre, social distancing, there is a disruption in the supply chain, uh, there's a lockdown, you can't, you can't do a lot right now. But, you see, when you wear your lens as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial mindset, you, you, see, you see opportunities, you see, yes. you see what you can do, what, what's different. In other words, Iba you don't look at it. You're not looking at the pain points as a problem. You're looking at the pain points as opportunities to yes. create business. So mm. that's why there's, there's, a, there's a very strong difference that when you talk to somebody who's an entrepreneur, he's not going to stand still and say, oh, no, so what's wrong with my business? No, he's going to say, okay, this is the current situation right now. What can I do to address the pain point so that I can fix up the business problem? So like for me, of course, it's dire right now. But let me just share with you an analogy which I got, which for me was a very great analogy of what's happened in this crisis. There was a guy in the States whose business closed down, restaurant. But he was, he was furiously scribbling ideas for new businesses. And somebody asked him, how come you're thinking of new ideas? Eh, kakasarala ng restaurant mo. Sabi niya, you know, it's okay to run out of money, but it's not okay to run out of ideas. And that's the one important thing that I want to stress to people. I mean, that, that's the sort of X factor or the resilience that people cannot see that yeah. is happening to the business here right now. Like one prime, one prime example, it's like what, what Congresswoman said, that there's what we call retooling. The jargon in business is called pivoting your business right now. And the pivot that many of these businesses are doing right now is literally uh, going digital transformation. May joke na, diba, uh, Congresswoman, sabi nila, who is causing the digital transformation of your company? Ito ba yung inyong CEO? Ito ba yung inyong chief? technology officer, or ito ba yung COVID? Eh, yung COVID yung nagtumutulak sa atin ngayon na bumago yung ating industriya. But you must realize, you know what, um, things like, you know, for the past five to ten years, we've been really trying to push to go to a cashless economy or even getting more people banked, di ba? The thing is, this COVID crisis has actually pushed us going more digital, going more cashless, doing more financial inclusion, and going e-commerce. I mean, so so what I'm trying to say is that, as uh, you know what, in, in business, there's what we call disruption, diba? Uh, you, you, the, the mantra now is disrupt or be disrupted, innovate or die. Diba? Yung sinasabi nila lagi. So, that means that any business, whether it was taxi, hotel, uh, transportation, was disrupted by technology and startup. Right now, what's just happening is also, it's a disruption. But the difference in the disruption right now is that it's not a disruption by technology, it's a disruption by pandemic, diba? A once-in-a-lifetime event. But the common denominator in the head of the entrepreneur is to look at it also like with through entrepreneurial lens and saying, okay, there is a pain point lang. I just need to address it. And that to me is, is, is the bigger point that I see. So yes, many restaurants have closed down. What do you do to address things? Diba? You don't only look at the problem head on. You can look at solving it laterally. Can you, turn, can you, can you do something on the e-commerce platform? Can you do something on the digital platform? Can you do something on the supply side platform? For example, my own business, Mercato Central. You know what? So uh, let me give you an example of what happened to me. I was the largest night food market. Humigit kumulang 50 yung mga vendors ko gabi-gabi sa market. When this was announced, I had to close down my market because it was a place of mass gathering. What do I do now? There's not that I can't do anything at that point, di ba? If I was just a businessman, I would say, ayan, sarado yung negosyo, I can't do anything. But what is that entrepreneurial factor that you put in your pivoting, that re retooling, rejigging things? I looked at what the essence of my business is, diba? And the essence of what my business is, is that I am an incubator for new food concepts, diba? That's essentially what I do. I understand what my business is. So the pivot or the rejigging of my business has to say, okay, alam ko na ako magaling mag incubate ng negosyo. Paano ako kumikita ng, ng pera noon? Yan yung tinatawag na business model. Kumikita ako dahil may mga taong nagbabayad ng renta sa akin para gumawa ng isang market. Adyan ako kumikita ng pera. 
how can I incubate right now? Knowing what, what happened is that I had I had to develop uh, a software, an app. It's a B to B to C app. What do I mean by B to B to C app? It's a Mercato app. I developed it together with these people called Multisys, and it's an app that connects small food vendors directly to their clients. And it's a, that's the B two C business to client. And it's a, the other portion of the app is B two B. It connects okay. small food suppliers to small food vendors. It mm -hmm. aggregates everything. Nice. And this sort of thing happens because of this crisis. I could have seen this crisis as something pataying negosyo ko. But I realized that there's a larger picture right now. As an entrepreneur, you got to see what is disaggregated, what is unconsolidated during this time that I can put together. Hindi po ba, um, Congressman Kimbo, how do you find out new vendors during this time? Survivor, and daming lumalabas sa Vibers and all these Facebook groups, they're all disaggregated. Yes. If you look online, the crisis, the crisis is the mother of uh, invention and then Desperation is and the all. mother of innovation. That's what I often say. Because this is what, this is, this is what I say, di ba? In business, if you want to good, be, be a good businessman, you have to say, or a good entrepreneur, you say, okay, there are pain points. Your job as an entrepreneur is to find the solutions to those pain points, di ba? Or innovation, in, in, uh, your irritation leads to your innovation, di ba? So when you see a problem, you want to solve it. But the way that you solve that problem, that is where innovation lies, di ba? Sure. What did I see? I mean, yeah, let, let me explain a bit more, Barnes. I will open the mind, but you get it very clear. So in this situation, I saw, okay, and daming lumalabas na entrepreneurs ngayon who need to be properly incubated. Because at this time, kumbaga, there's, everything's disconnected. There's, there's small groups putting up all these different, um, where can I buy food? Who can, how can I supply these people? It wasn't aggregated into one site. But if you put that together, which is the basic idea of, of, of online platforms, if you put them all together into one place and make people go there, you... In the other hand, as an entrepreneur, you should have, you should build all the roads going to your platform, but then you own the toll gate. So you charge them all for coming into the site. Yeah. And that's basically what we did. We are still an incubator, but because you've got that, in, that, that sort of like that innovation mindset, you, you, you change and you pivot things around to continue doing business. And that's why I didn't want to talk about the dismal part, but rather what I want to focus on, because it's dismal anyway. We, we know that already, Kumbaga, that's a fact. But what's more important right now is to tackle the idea of how do people think about how we should approach business at, the, at this point, uh, point in time. And I'll talk, about something with, uh, I'll talk about something more later on uh, because I have something, there's something close to my heart that's close to the heart also of uh, Congressman Kimbo, which is uh, real estate. Uh, but I'll tell you later on. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'll take, care of, totally. I'll take care of the dismal part, if you don't mind. I'll <laughs> take care of the dismal part. Having said all that, as Congresswoman uh, Kimbo mentioned, the SWS survey showed that uh, almost half of all Filipino adults say that they're, they're jobless right now. 45.5%, that is staggering. That amounts to around 27.3 million Filipinos who are jobless. So, I mean, having said all that, you know, that there are ways to do business, you know, new ways of doing business, I mean, does this surprise you, this this number? Um, and maybe um, Congresswoman Kimbo can also add to that. Yeah, you know, when, when RJ was talking, I really wanted to, like, stand and clap because, to be honest, that's exactly how we want to recover, right? I mean, clearly, RJ is, like, on the frontier. I mean, th that, for me, is the ideal mindset. But unfortunately, many of our MSMEs, there's, like, 1 million registered MSMEs, I estimate that there's maybe another 5 million that's not registered. So we're looking at like 6 million of them. How many are are, are in the non-essential sectors? My estimate is 5.25 million. Unfortunately, many of them are not even banked. 77% of Filipinos are not banked. So many of these um, 5.2 million MSMEs in the non-essential sectors, meaning critically impacted, are not capacitated to, to think like RJ. So that for, for so for us, um, we need to like uh, pass legislation that would precisely empower these 5.25 million MSMEs to think like RJ. Diba? So like at least um, get them to 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 walk into a formal 
financial institution and take out a loan. That's the first step. But can you imagine? Eh, they don't even have bank accounts. And mm-hmm. they have to fill out a loan application form, right? So, so these are the small things that that uh, we think are really needed and that should go into the economic stimulus package. So not only do you provide loanable funds, so huge amounts of that, but also credit mediation. How do you bring them into the yeah. form of yeah. uh, banking system? And hindi pa yun, the first step muna, you get them to, to the register. Bank. To get banked. <laughs> to get <laughs> banked. <laughs> yeah, to c- come up, right? And be, be formal. So, so, ganun eh. so, ang dami. so, at first we were thinking, and this is in the Arise Bill, but not in Bayanihan 2, we really were pushing for wage subsidies. Because we were thinking, wage subsidies for critically impacted businesses, especially the small ones, meaning government supports the pasahod for like two months. Oh, malaking bagay yun. But syempre, if you sign up, oh, mag-register ka. Diba? So, kung dati kang informal, oh, mag-register ka na ngayon. Diba? So, at least, kahit paano, maka-capture na natin sila. And then not, not only that, um, then we can connect them now to the GFI so they can take out loans. So yun yung naiisip sana namin. No? Pero right now kasi, um, again, namahala ng government dun sa pre-post namin na 1.3 trillion economic stimulus. So now, nag-bite-size muna tayo, which is the Bayanihan 2, pero nandiyan din pa rin naman yung spirit ng Arise Bill, which I made point earlier. So, yun. So, ako, in my head, um, all is not lost rin naman on the government side kasi I think it's just a matter of scaling up this initial um, set of assistance. Okay. And then, uh, oh, uh, Stella, just, I wanted to add, sorry, Barnes, we don't mind me adding to what she had to say, no? Um, you know, part of my mindset is really because I... I, I, I I host a show on startup industry, the tech startup industry, the ecosystem, and so I'm very familiar with what they're doing, is that this is actually one of the best times that, that you can bring in fintech, insurtech, all these different things, to, because they, they're, they're all disruptors, and this is the best time to leverage that sort of technology to bring people to get banked. Eh? And that's what people don't realize. That's sort of like the X factor is the resilience of the entrepreneur. What am I trying to say? Diba, Congressman, Congresswoman, in these other countries like Nigeria, other countries where people are not banked, they use fintech technology to bring people into the bank, into the banking yes. sector, right? Yeah, e-wallets. Yeah, e-wallets. We could be more cashless. Oh we could be more cashless here right now. And that's why for me, it's actually, you know, that's why, that's what I talk about when you think about it, it's a big problem. Eh? It's a big problem, yes. But that's exactly what the entrepreneurs and these tech people are coming in to solve. Eh? And that's why for me, these are the things that must be considered that we encourage these type of entrepreneurs to, to, to come out and then, help think about these problems because like, for me, number one, you agree. Alam mo, ang dami pwedeng, yung agree, di ba, 1.3% lumaki siya. What if we had more agri-tech people coming in here in developing that particular sector? This, I think, parang, we're thinking all things will be held static, eh? I mean, parang, hindi, yeah. ma, hindi na magbabago yung agri. <laughs> hindi na magbabago yung how we do manufacturing. But that's exactly what tech startup and all these uh, entrepreneurs do. They're the ones to provide that exponential growth. Again, yes. we, just have, we just have to ex- encourage them because it's, out of the box thinking. If we think yeah. of it linearly, na okay, ganito na tayo solve we will really we will really go this way. But if people come in to solve problems, gagawin yun yung chart natin eh. And, and our, RJ, uh, just just a short just a short comment. Yung increase, yung growth ng agri, it's due to people like you. Eh kasi hindi naman dadami yung production ng farmers ko hindi dahil sa inyo na, 'di ba, that you've been able to organize your your ecosystem, your food vendors, your Exactly. The, 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 you have suppliers. So, syempre kinakailangan din nila na mag-source from the farms, right? So, so yun eh. Dun, Sana ma- well, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of ideas. Does the 27 million jobless align with your reality, or is it a bit? Um, sorry, it's not really a, a, an official statistic from the PSA, from the government. I don't know if RJ. I, I, can you just say yeah. it again, sir? It was choppy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, RJ, um, I was I was asking if the 27 million Filipinos jobless that came out in the SWA survey, does that align with your reality? With no, you're no, seeing yeah. on the ground? There's, there's a lot of people who are unemployed right now and we're, and we're doing our best. And that's why I'm part of Bounce Back. Diba? Bounce Back is a group, it's a business support group. And really, it's a lot of doing a lot of reskilling for people and, and upskilling for people right now. And if you, that's why for me, there's, there's going to be some, obviously there's going to be from friction costs because you're going to have to transfer people from one industry to another. But let me just point out two things which I think are, are, are very key here right now, at least from where I'm sitting. 
I wear two different hats. One hat is I, I'm involved in the real estate industry. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that one. But the other industry that I'm involved in right now is also, yeah, it's also the, uh, bis- the BPO industry. I run a company called EnterPH. We are a consultancy firm that helps foreign businesses set up shop here in the Philippines. In other words, their pain point is mahirap magpatayo ng negosyo sa Pilipinas. How do we get in? Now, I bring that up because um, the, the, the time, and I'm sure Congresswoman knows this one, the time that our BPO industry in the Philippines grew the fastest was 2008 to 2010. Bakit? Kasi may U.S. recession nung time na yan. So what did these companies in the States do? They said, okay, kasi may problema sa States for cost-saving purposes. We will, we will move our company to the Philippines kasi for every $1 we spend in the U.S., it only costs me 20 cents in the Philippines, but I get the same quality of work. So talaga lumaki yung kanilang industriya. I'm saying this one because right now what I'm experiencing in EnterPH, my business, is um, I'm getting a, a surge of inquiries yeah. coming from abroad of people yes. who, want, who want to do BPO here. At yes. hindi lang ito yung malalaki ha, kasi I handle mga boutique, yung mga MSME type from abroad, and yung outsourcing mm-hmm. in nila, hindi puro contact center ha. These are architects, you know, other, other business processes which they can outsource over here. So obviously, you know, we're losing people in the BPO, but so there's going to be some friction costs. But then there's still a lot more that the, the, the people who still want to come to the Philippines because as everybody else suffers, the silver lining is that the Philippines can be the people who absorb all these different, uh, uh, all the losses that the other countries are experiencing. Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. seeing on, on a larger scale uh, will happen to us. So that's one thing I'm mm-hmm. seeing. So And even the office space, when they get office space here, we're losing some office space because of the Pogos leaving or the other BPOs leaving. But when the new ones come in, they have to have social distancing protocols. So when they buy office space, they won't just buy one office space now. Yeah. They'll, buy double, they'll buy double the office space to, to, rent <laughs> like, uh, to rent for leasing. So that's one part of the BPO. The second one which I want to handle is this one. So I also work for a company called Filipino Homes. Filipino Homes is sort of like the Uber of real estate marketing in the Philippines because they've aggregated all the top developers, 500 plus, and they do the marketing online to OFWs abroad. They are not selling luxury condos. They are selling first homes, which are close to my heart, which are yung mga, kay, 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 alam ni Congressman, Congressman Kim, Kim Poto, eh, yung mga Kimbo, yung mga 500K hanggang 1.5, yung mga economic and socialized housing. Yan yung hot na hot na properties ngayon. In yeah. the period of the lockdown, maniwala man kayo o hindi, Filipino homes sold an average of 3 to 4 billion pesos worth of residential properties to OFWs abroad. Because, and this was all via OFW marketing. And as you know, malaki multiplier effect ng, 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 ng construction ng, of, of, this, of these first homes. So they're not selling the luxury condos. Ha? This is not a 12 to 15 million. These are actually the smaller ones. And that's great for me. That's a great sign that they're buying actively here right now in the country. And they're not just buying mainly in, um, they're not buying mainly in Metro Manila. The, the properties that they're selling, they're, they're, they're basically a, vis, a company in Visayas, Mindanao. They're selling Butuan, Surigao, Bohol, Naga, Kamsur. So they're selling in outside of Metro Manila, which is good, which really spurs uh, development in this area. And why is that key? Because we know that there's still a lot of, even if there are some OFWs came home, we still have 28.1 trillion pesos coming in from our OFWs a year. I'm, I'm not sure if the number is correct, but the, the good congresswoman would know. There's still a lot of money coming in from our OFWs, which will be spent here on real estate, Sana, because we have a housing backlog of 5.7 million units. So for me, that, that, that's, very, that's, that's one of the key things also. Uh, that's in, that's a, that's another thriving industry that can continue to grow when we find that that those because and that we have OFWs who need to buy first homes eh. mm-hmm. and then the last one alang that's one why, why I'm very enthusiastic as well. <laughs> I run one more company called Easy Franchise. Easy Franchise is a digital platform that connects franchisors to franchisees. Why it's good is because yung mga franchisees ay hindi lang dito galing sa Pilipinas kundi mga OFWs na gusto ng kumuha ng franchises hindi lang sa Manila kundi sa mga probinsya nila. They, they get franchises and we have them. We have managers who run their franchises in the provinces. Why is that good for, for grassroots development? Because the mga binibiling franchise ngayon, I, the people say, should I invest in a franchise during this pandemic? Yes, but particularly the mga essential franchises. Water refilling, laundry, LPG, convenience store, pharmaceutical. 
Grabe yung galaw ng mga yan. These are all doing good and it's spreading across the countryside. So for me, I'm still very enthusiastic because I'm seeing that there's money coming in for for real estate, particularly for the for the for for uh, for affordable housing. Uh, mm -hmm. I see that there is people. I see that there is business coming in from abroad. The silver lining of business abroad doing bad is that they come to the Philippines because it's cheaper to do business over here. And, and number three. Uh, we're see there's still the strong domestic consumption. They're just not consuming anymore in the malls. They're now consuming near the barangays. But, and, con and consumption and confidence in consumption is a key driver of the economy. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, my additional stuff. Not, not as heavy as uh, Congresswoman Kimbo's uh, economic data, but for me, that's what I'm just seeing on the ground there. No, no, I mean, I, I, I also do see some, some silver lining, of course. Um, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to pick up yeah. on... You construction know, sector. I'd like to pick up on the construction sector. I'd like to pick up on the construction sector that RJ uh, mentioned. He, he mentioned private sector construction, of course, but the government is banking on its build, build, build program for long term economic recovery. So I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts, Congresswoman Kimbo, on this. Can we bank on the build, build, build program primarily? Yes. As part of the I as an economic recovery program, um, because that definitely. seems to be what the finance department is banking on. But there are problems with it, of course. You know, uh, delays in the projects, and historically we've seen corruption in these public infrastructure projects. So, is that a wise um, investment to be in, in with regards to overall economic recovery? Well, certainly, as RJ mentioned, the multiplier for construction is between three to four. Uh, for every one peso that you put in, mga nganak yan, magiging three to four pesos. So, malaki talaga yung impact in terms of job creation. And because the government is, uh, well, has money, right? So, you might as well let government put its money into its construction projects, oh. which anyway, um, they've had a, 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 lahat naman yan nasa pipeline nila, di ba? They have a six-year um, build, build, build program. So now's the time to actually do it, no? especially now that many of the private businesses may sumababa yung confidence level, di ba? So, puno ang dapat yan ng gobyerno. So, but, if the question is, can we bank on it alone? Tingin ko hindi. Tingin ko kulang pa rin, di ba? So, kailangan din natin ng demand side, no? So, paano yung mga displaced workers sa non-construction sector? Di ba? So, um, we need to to provide unemployment assistance. We need to be able to create jobs, right? We need to be able to pro to promote business continuity in the other sectors din naman, kasi hindi naman pwede puro construction. Oh. So, it's certainly very, uh, it has a very big value added to economic recovery, pero hindi, hindi kaya na siya lang. No? So, kailangan holistic talaga. Diba? Yung 165 billion pesos uh, bayanihan to, you said, that's not enough. And si um, Tita Winnie Monson has said today in her column, she said it's like injecting aspirin to uh, hemorrhaging. <laughs> yes, to a hemorrhaging wound. Um, you agree with that, of course. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> what, are, what are the chances that the Bayanihan 3 with a 1.3 trillion peso stimulus would pass? Certainly, um, the chances that Abayan Nihan 3 would pass is like very high. I mean, I'm sorry, maliyating English. Mataas ang probability that uh, Abayan Nihan 3 would be passed. Okay? Um, but as to how much, we don't know. Um, again, itong, itong 140, 265 billion. Um, ang hirap nun, di ba? We had to fight tooth and nail to be able to get, to get that, di ba? Pero... Um, hopefully, if, um, ako for me kasi, ang pagtingin ko dyan, um, if we're able to put a better handle on the COVID situation, I think it's going to be, uh, that, that is what's going to give confidence to our economic managers to spend more. Ang problema kasi, many, much of the uncertainty is really coming from the COVID situation. Imagine 6,000 new cases every day. Hindi naman natin inasahan na ganito to. Whereas our um, neighbors in the ASEAN, for example, Vietnam, diba, they've been able to control their COVID situation. So yung kinakwento kanina ni RJ na 
na um, they've been receiving many inquiries from abroad, yan dapat ang susi. At this point in time, kailangan maghanap na tayo ng opportunities abroad, di ba? Kasi uh, yung magpo-pull out from China, dapat makuha natin yan. Pero hindi natin sila makukuha unless we put a handle on our COVID situation. Kasi kung ikaw ay isang foreign investor, bakit ka pupunta sa Pilipinas kung alam mo magkakasakit ka lang, di ba? Ang, ang, some of them nga would say, nako, eh, at least sa Vietnam, at least alam namin, mas mataas ang, 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 ang chances na hindi kami magkakasakit. Di ba? So between the Philippines and Vietnam, on the basis of that alone, they might choose Vietnam over us. So that's the name of the game now. Ang, if you ask me, ha, kung ano i-prioritize dapat natin for purposes of economic recovery, uh, dapat natin solusyonan ng ating COVID situation. Of course, it's impossible to bring it down to zero, di ba? Pero at least, let's slow down the spread, di ba? If we see a slowing down of the spread, then eventually the numbers would go down. Diba? And that will give us confidence. And RJ would know that he owns a restaurant. Kapag tumataas ang number of cases, uh, matik yan, mawawalan ka ng customer, yeah. di ba? Pero pag yeah. bumababa yung cases, no naging, di ba, no medyo bumaba siya ng konti, ayan, nagsilabasa naman yung mga tao. So related yung, ano eh, yung COVID situation with um, business sentiment. Oh, sabi nga, okay. I, I, I also have a podcast, uh, Congresswoman Kimbo. I, I have a podcast uh, recently, and I had uh, Dr. Alvin Ang and ah. uh, Michael Ricofort, both economists over there. And they really, just to, just to be clear, now that uh, we are a consumption-driven economy, and what needs to get started is conf confidence. You know, this consumption is a function of confidence. Yeah. That's why during the MECQ, you saw the economic, even the restaurants were seeing the economic recovery. When we go back to, when we went back to MECQ, uh, this period of time, siyempre, nawala ulit yung confidence yes. ng mga tao. Since we go, we go back again. So really, it's just the management uh, of the crisis, which is very, which is very key. Management, living with the crisis, it's it's clear that we can see that we can live with it. I think we're okay now with that one. Eh? Uh, um, just real quick, RJ. So what do you think about this, um, the government response? As a businessman, what do you think about the, the kind of balance that balancing act that the government has been doing, you know, these community quarantines, you know, from ECQ going to MECQ, GCQ, going back to MECQ when health workers said that they needed a timeout, and then now back again to GCQ. It's difficult as a businessman, Shempre, you, you, you're you weighing both, you know, health over profit, and you want to strike a balance for both. At Shempre, nung una, gusto mo sana na after the first month ng ECQ natin, sabi ni Joey Concepcion nung timeline, we can't afford a second lockdown, but Technically, we've gone beyond sec we've gone beyond second lockdowns already, di ba? But I, I think the the big the bigger thing really right now, no, as a as a businessman, is that we're, what the message that we want to communicate is we have to find a way to manage and live with the virus. We cannot, you know, if you look at the death, if you're looking at the death rate of this one, mababa yung death rate natin. I mean, that's how I see it. Mababa yung death rate, mataas yung cases, mababa yung death rate. Uh, the number of symptoms that really fatal ones is not big. The mild symptoms, marame, di ba? So, I mean, it's just a matter of us finding ways, how, how can we find ways to live with it that it creates confidence again so businesses can restart properly, diba? Because if you look at what the restaurants are doing, the, the group I've been resto PH, they're going above and beyond. They're creating their own guidelines already just to make sure that they can resume the business and, and, and do it safely. But yung pakiusap namin sa gobyerno, baka naman, diba? Um, the countries which have done well are countries which have had Controlled guess, COVID. Yeah, and what, who had plagues in the you can guy in let's say Hong Kong or India because they've had plagues in the they've had similar viruses in the past. Sanay silang parang sa masalay silang magcontrol, di ba? Ng COVID. So bakit ayon naman? Maybe there's a way right now we can put in place na you know let's do granular like what New York did, granular lockdowns. You know you do specific air instead of doing a blanket type of closing. Baka para signal number one, signal number two, signal number three. Oh, say area na to signal number one. They close down uh, signal number three. Close down everything there but allow business to continue. In other words, uh, unfortunately, this, this virus has really hampered uh, our, our life, but then we, we, it can't leave us mortified to leave our homes. And we've got to continue the business. I mean, mm -hmm. may pro, pro and con na lang yan, di ba? Uh, eventually, we have, to, we have to move on. You, you are opening something on September 1st, right? Uh, we're opening so our... Yeah, we're doing a safe and outdoor dining environment kasi sabi namin yung mga tao ayaw kumain sa mga mall. So, mm -hmm. what's the pain point? People don't want to eat in the mall. Uh, so with, with this, we'll, we create a safe and outdoor dining environment where people can eat outside of the mall with the restaurants, creating their own menus. So that's what so we did. Going to, a, 
DGC. Yeah. So, Punta kayo, Congresswoman. Ah. It's called High Street, right? High, uh, high Street, S-T-R-E-E-T. S-T-R-E-E-T. Yes. Um, but how are you going to I ensure the safety, the safety yeah. of your customers? Um, because I think that that will be one of the concerns, of course. Oh. How do you... Want how are you planning to attract people to go to this food market and you know go back to doing these normal eating out stuff that we used kung, to kung do kung alam mo diyan di ba barns naman alala mo nung tayo ay pumasok na sa GCQ ay bumabalik na yung mga tao sa mga mall eh di ba bumabalik na yung mga tao sa mga mall as long as tama yung mga safety protocols na ginagawa nila at sinusundan yung mga sinasabi ng IATF naman and then when the, when the MECQ happened, nawala ulit ang kumpiyansa. At syempre nawala na tayo yung mga mall. So in other words, people, the people want to go out and they want to follow the rules naman when they go out. Pero pareho rin naman kami. Kami, we have to follow what the IATF tells, me, tells us and we have to follow what the LGU tells us as well. Yeah. But the thing is, what we know even more is that kahit sa mga New York at sa iba't ibang, iba't ibang mga bansa, kumakain sila sa labas ngayon, that's a new thing. The new thing is to eat outdoor, di ba? Because... At least the virus cannot, you know, it's not spreading inside a, inside an enclosed space. You're you're outdoor, and that's much safer instead of going indoor. And that's what we're trying to encourage right now. You're trying, kumbaga kami. We're just doing again what we have to do as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur mindset, may problema. We try to solve it within the boundaries of what we are given, and we're trying to innovate also as well. So yung mga restaurants hindi sila di pa sila hindi sila sanay mag food market kami sanay na sanay na kami so we also educate them how, how to do it properly um, we tell them to use new enemy. but why will you eat here o kunya ni ikaw uh, congressman Kimbo you go to Wolfgang Steakhouse you spend 7000 pesos to eat a piece of steak what if we do an outdoor market with Wolfgang Steakhouse where you could get a roast beef sandwich from them for 200 pesos only or 300 pesos only they pupunta ka diba Count me in. <laughs> yung innovation, di ba? Or, kunyari si Chef Chele, ng Gallery by Chele, gagawa ng bibing ka cheesecake, pwede, pwede mong bilhin dito. Pupunta ka because there's something unique, eh, di ba? So, may innovation. Nice. You partner, you're following the, uh, the, the the regulation, pero may innovation at the same time. And you, and you, and you, and you follow the guidelines. That's what you want. That's, that's what we need during times like this one. And there's no guarantee that it's always going to work. There's, you know what? I got this really good piece of advice from uh, the chief operating officer of Phoenix, si Bong Fadulion. Nung crisis, nag- I, I, I interviewed him. Itong sabi niya sa akin, you know, RJ, as much as possible, you have to try to open your business during the ECQ. And sabi niya, bakit? Because, you know what? Kung nagsara ka ng tindahan before ECQ at magbubukas ka ng tindahan after ECQ, iba na yung mundo. What you, what you have to do is, during that period of time, magbukas ka ng negosyo, you will fail, obviously. There'll be points that you won't be doing good. But think of yourself like an athlete. You're conditioning your body, you're conditioning your business para pagsimula ulit ang negosyo, tatakbo ka, di ba? Hindi ka, mag, hindi ka mag, pagbukas ang negosyo ulit, dyan ka na magsisimula ulit. You're already too late and the world has already changed. Parang, oh. So that's the point, di ba? Open business, entrepreneur, you make a mistake, good, you fail, fail, fast, fail, forward, go next, di ba? My my producer is telling me that we are already out of time. No, no, super problem. out of time. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask uh, my my last couple of questions for Congresswoman Kimbo. Um, I want to ask one last question about Bayanihan. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm just gonna ask all these questions already, and you can just answer in one go, Congresswoman Kimbo. Um, but just one last question on Bayanihan because one of the issues has been even with Bayanihan one has been oversight of how the money has been spent. So how, how do you think you're going to be able to monitor how this money uh, for Bayanihan 2 is going to be spent and even for future uh, Bayanihan bills? Because um, what has happened, yung pagbigay ng ayuda, yung sa Bayanihan 1, parang nalate talaga ng pagbigay ng ayuda. Tapos parang medyo nagkagulo nga sa pagbigay ng, ng ayuda. And then the second question is about PhilHealth. Because you... Um, Filed the House Bill number 7429 or the Social Health Insurance Crisis Act of 2020, which I understand is uh, a bill that would seek or that seeks to privatize certain parts of the state health insurer bill health. But there has been some mm, negative reactions to this. Uh, for example, Senator Manny Pacquiao saying that uh, this would only drive up premiums and would make uh, healthcare unaffordable to many Filipinos. And then, you know, you have um, the Boklura na Magagawang Pilipino, which is a labor group, basically saying the same thing, you know, 
they're saying that the privatization of field health isn't the solution. Um, and in fact, the solution is the nationalization of the healthcare system. All right. All right. Um on the first question, uh, there are reportorial requirements. Uh, the agencies, uh, particularly uh, the executive, has to uh, submit monthly reports uh, to Congress. So, um, and they've been actually good with that. Um, in fact, you know, when I'm in monthly, under Bayanihan one, it was weekly. Um, and, and then, well, it's honestly, weekly is just too short a period of time, really, to get like a... In fact, to read a very long report and you do it weekly, hindi mo na, by the time you absorb it, na na ulit yung bagong report, hindi oh. ganun effective. So we decided, let's make it a monthly report. Anyway, anytime naman na kailangan kayong ipatawag ng Congress, eh, dadating naman sila, which we've done many times because precisely what you pointed out, that there were problems in the disburs disbursement of the ayuda. Um, but then after several hearings, I think nagkaroon naman ng konting enlightenment naman. No? And so we were able to actually streamline the process. And in, eventually, I mean, streamline process is in adjust ng Congress. Yun naman ang uh, inadapt eventually. Um, now, on your second point, um, well, thanks for asking that question because I think there's like a lot of um, confusion as to what I was proposing. Because what I was proposing, although I used the word privatize, what I really meant was outsource certain functions, which I'm sure RJ knows because um, I, that's precisely what BPO, BPOs do, right? Meaning to say, like, for example, customer relations. If you want to hire your own agents to answer the phone and answer questions, you outsource mo na lang yan, di ba? And so that is precisely um, the idea. The PhilHealth will continue to be a government program. It will continue to be a social health insurance program. In other words, subsidized premiums. It will continue to be nonprofit. What we just want to do is to use the expertise of government for certain functions because clearly, based on what we've been hearing from all the hearings of both the Senate and the House, it talaga nga naman, there's systemic and widespread fraud and it's been there for the longest time from the day they started. And number two, they don't even have the basic competencies to run a health insurance program. They can't count their members properly, they can't count their money, they don't know how to pay doctors. It's a mess, basically. Right? Um, they don't have a proper IT system, they don't have data, and data is the heart and soul of a health insurance program. So, in other words, let's sit down, let's figure out which functions need to be outsourced for the private sector because the private sector does a better job than government in these functions. So, let's assess that for two years, right? And then we begin to competitively select um, private sector firms that can precisely provide those functions. So that's the idea. I mean, you know, um, siguro nagka-confusion nung sinabing pri privatization. In fact, yung Bukluran, the one that you mentioned, if you read the full statement, they precisely said, we're okay if you do management contracts. And in my head, but that's precisely what I said, right? Except that they just spun it and made it look like it was a, going to be a private corporation. And as to the premiums, it's clear in the law what the premiums are going to be for the next 10 years. It's mm -hmm. stipulated. by It's by statute what the premium is. And I'm going to tell you, I am so sure that if it's run efficiently at walang pagnanakaw na nangyayari on a large scale, baba ba pa ang presyo ng health insurance. Yan ang aking prediction. So, so, yun. so, thanks for asking. Kasi, sorry, ha, na, masyado ako na-excite to answer. <laughs> I was like, okay. Actually, I mean, I have a lot more. Yeah. I have a lot more questions and a lot more things that I want to discuss with both of you, but we don't have time anymore. Uh, but just one last thing. So, Bayanihan 2 is good as past? Yes. Um, we just have to, so the Senate has already ratified it. Kami naman sa House. It's probably going to be on Monday. Okay. So, Great. Be All right. Now, that note, thank you so much for your time, RJ Ledesma and Congresswoman Stella Kimbo. I'm not going to ask for any more closing words from you because my producer says. <laughs> really, I just, I just really, want to really, say one really. thing. I'm just praying for the good health of, uh, of Miro Kimbo, praying that everything is good for the family and the Kimbo family. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Nice talking to you guys. Thank you, Congresswoman. All right. Lawrence, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone 
who tuned in on our Facebook page. Apologies, we were not able to get to your comments and questions. But do catch us live on our Facebook page. Now you know PH Viewpoint is on every Saturday at 6 p.m. Again, my name is Barnaby Lowe. This is Viewpoint. Now you know.